Dr. Stuart Robertshaw, a.k.a. Dr. Humor, is doing his best to spread the condition. He currently serves as the president and CEO of the National Association for the Humor Impaired. CMSA is thrilled to present to you Dr. Humor. Thank you very much. Oh, that was great. What I want to share with you today is an incredible story. It's a story about a lifelong love of humor, about a passion for life, and about the healing powers of laughter. As Kathy mentioned, my background is actually in special education, psychology. I joined the faculty at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse in 1971. I completed my doctorate at the University of Kansas. I thought my formal educational career was complete then, but I became keenly interested in law approximately December 31st of 1976, around 6 p.m. <laughs> There's a knock on the door as the local sheriff said, are you Stuart Robertshaw? I said, yeah, good sign right here. I signed this document, opened this envelope. I was being sued for $100,000. I had given a failing grade to a student teacher in special education for emotionally disturbed children. It was my judgment she was more disturbed than the kids. <laughs> After two years of being dragged through state court and federal court, you finally won the case in Madison, Wisconsin. But I think things happen to you on this planet for a reason. When I was first being sued, I was terrified. I knew nothing about law. Over that two-year process, I fell in love with the process. This is fascinating. So in 1978, as soon as we won the case, I went to law school for three years, the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and returned back to my job in La Crosse. Now, I tell you that because in 19, uh, see, 1981, I was the only person in the entire state of Wisconsin with a PhD in special education and a law degree. So I'm now known as Judge Judy of special ed. <laughs> Between 1981 and, the, and the 2001, I conducted over 25 cases as an administrative law judge. And that's where the concept of humor impairment started for me. Some very funny things happened in my courtroom I thought were wonderfully outrageous. I found myself laughing like mad, looking around, nobody else even cracking a smile. <laughs> Give an example of a case in Milwaukee, 1983. Mom and Dad filed suit against the Milwaukee public school system on behalf of their son, Ben. Ben was 13 years of age, diagnosed mentally retarded, delightful young man, great social skills. He's gonna just, just do fine on this planet. 25 people in the courtroom. Mom was the last witness on the witness stand about 2.30 on a Friday afternoon. Her last parting comment to me, Judge, Judge, is, uh, I, I, I know what my paperwork says about, about my kids' program, but I, I read all the stuff about the, about the health education program, but I've been in that teacher's classroom. I know she really teaches sex education. I know she'd be teaching my son, Ben, how to do intercourse and passing out free condominiums. <laughs> to which I said the record, how do you sign up for that class? <laughs> But unlike you, not a soul in the room even cracked a smile. And usually when there's a natural blooper like that, you get a little twinkle in the eye, a little curl in the lips, nothing. These people were so intense. So that four-hour drive from Milwaukee back to my hometown of La Crosse, I kept fixated on how sad it must be that people are just totally, totally unable to laugh in a natural situation. They're humor impaired, I guess. So I fired the idea away, and it came back to me in a very different way. Uh, uh, 1987, I, I got a, a, a call from a, from a publisher who wanted to know if I would review a manuscript of a new textbook. He said, sure, send it to me before they go to final publication. I went through, about, spent about three weeks in the evening working on this, this book, Manuscript Suggestion Improvements, and in this book was a chapter that changed my life. The chapter was on joy, creativity, and humor in young children, and a quote that really got my attention. The quote said, preschool children laugh or smile on the average of 400 times a day. Adults over the age of 35, 15 times a day. I got my mother-in-law, 1.2. <laughs> and I became fascinated with this idea. I didn't know much about humor. I've always loved humor. Been a joke teller, a class clown. So I made a personal pledge to myself. I spent four hours a week in the University Library for the next 90 days reading, studying, and learning about humor. I had just taken the Stephen Covey workshop on seven habits of highly effective people. Wonderful. And they teach you how to prioritize your time and, and decide what's important. So I said to myself, okay, I'm, I'm going to write a contract. I still carry the contract today. I write a contract with myself. I'm going to spend four hours a week in the University Library reading all the research I can find on laughter and humor. 
I started doing that back in 1987. I am still doing the same thing today some 29 years. What I found was an explosion of research on laughter and humor I didn't know existed before. For example, laughter exercises the lungs. It increases oxygen flow in the blood. It actually increases relaxation with following heart laughter. Our blood pressure and pulse rate both go below resting level for about 45 minutes and gradually come back to the baseline. There's a researcher at Stanford University, Dr. William Fry, who tells us that 10 seconds of hearty laughter is the physiological equivalent of five minutes of medium jogging. So for those of you who feel guilty about not jogging, <laughs> get in the morning, laugh your ass off, and go back to bed. <laughs> Anyway, I, I spent all this time collecting research and laughter and stuff, material in the, in the library for three years. And in, maybe I started in 1987. 1990, I collected all this material. I had no idea what I was going to do with it. And then I came up with this crazy idea. You know, rather, I, I published a couple of articles in, in academic boring journals. And I said, you know, rather than put this stuff in boring academic journals only a few people see, I should make it public. So I put together a press release, listed all things I learned about humor in my time in the library. And I sent it out to five states in the Midwest, and I was trying to figure a way to make it interesting so they would do something with it. So I came up with this idea, announcing the formation of the National Association for the Humor Impaired. As a joke, a funny idea. What happened next was the reporter in my hometown of La Crosse, Wisconsin, sent the, the, so the press release, International Wire Service, AC, Associated Press, all over the world, and did not say a word to me. Four days after I sat it off, I'm having dinner with my family one night about 7 o'clock. The phone rings. Hello, is Dr. Humor there? That was not even a name I was familiar with at that point. Uh, yeah, this is Dr. Humor. I said, how can I help you? Doctor, my name is Mitchell Yell. I'm a disc jockey from Toronto, Canada. I want to talk to you about your theories of humor going live in five seconds. What? <laughs> no preparation. Awful interview. My voice was cracking. I was talking too fast. It was terrible. I couldn't wait to get off the phone. Put the phone, the phone down, turn around to my family and say, you won't believe what just happened. The phone rang again. The second guy was a country and western disc jockey from Houston, Texas, by the name of Moby Dick. <laughs> over 600 interviews over a three-week period, 24 hours a day, all over the world. From, from uh, Tel Aviv, from uh, uh, Stockholm, from uh, a big article in the London Times, the New York Times. Everybody in the rest of the world thought the Association of the Humor Prayer was real. <laughs> And then, and then I, I, after I, a couple of interviews, I figured out what was going on. So I stayed, the whole night, all night, I stayed up and filled my kitchen wall with little post-it notes of, of questions and answers about the research on laughter and humor. So when these people did the interviews, I could walk around and be, sound reasonably intelligent. <laughs> and then I got a phone call from Family Circle Magazine. They wanted to send a photographer reporter out to La Crosse, Wisconsin, from New York, and do a story on the association. I said, oh, sure, come on out. I didn't even know what Family Circle Magazine was. <laughs> I thought it was some kind of recipe book or something. So I spent a nice day with these people, took them out to dinner, put them in a plane the next day, sent them home. I'll show you a slide. In February of 1991, an article about the National Association for the Humor Impaired hit Family Circle magazine. Come to find out that magazine is a 5.5 million, million circulation. I had no idea. From that one article, I got 27,000 pieces of mail in my little mailbox at home. If you wanted more information about the association, I had nothing to give them. <laughs> but luckily, just luckily, Lady from Family Circle said, by the way, Stu, your press release doesn't tell people how to join the organization <laughs> or how much the dues are. <laughs> well, I am an opportunist. <laughs> so I said, oh, six dollars for a lifetime membership? <laughs> Then she said at the airport, said, what do they get for $6? Oh, Lord, what do they get? <laughs> so off the top of the, top of the head, I said, well, they got a wallet size <laughs> membership card. <laughs> they got an eight and a half uh, by 11 certificate suitable for framing. <laughs> and they get a, this, this word, exclusive copy of the quick score test of humor impairment. So you can actually diagnose yourself with a humor impaired or at risk for humor impairment. You rate these items as zero, not funny, one, mildly amusing, two, funny, or three, very funny. You get your individual scores. Some sample items, for example, uh, no matter how low your self-esteem, never forget there are others who think less of you.
Happiness is seeing your boss on a milk carton. <laughs> it's okay to laugh in the bedroom as long as you don't point. <laughs> Never buy a TV set in the sidewalk from a man who's out of breath. <laughs> and the people who eat natural foods will die of natural causes. I'm very proud to tell you I now have over 9,000 lifetime members in the National Association for the Human Repaired. Yeah, you math whiz, let's see, 9,000 times six bucks, this guy's making some nice change. True story, for about maybe two weeks, I thought I was going to be wealthy. I thought I had the new pet rock, the new hula hoop. One day alone, I had 174 $6 checks in my mailbox at home. I told my wife, sell the kids, we're out of here. <laughs> But you'd be shocked at how many people in America will send you a $6 check that bounces. <laughs> Over the next two weeks, I deposited 600 checks, 21 of them bounced. Then the bank charged me 20 bucks for each one that bounced. <laughs> that, didn't seem, that didn't seem fair to me, it wasn't my problem. But my wife explained to me, you know, all these checks bounce in your account, you can ruin your credit rating. So I changed the rules. Anybody wants a free membership in the National Association for the Human Repaired, all you do is sit down and write, tell me a story, the funniest thing that ever happened to you. Not a joke, a real, real story. And from that, you get the test, you get a certificate, you get a bumper sticker, I support the work of the National Association for the Human Repaired. What I found this incredible journey I'm on is that real things that happen to people are so much richer and so much funnier than jokes. Jokes are an instant burst of laughter. They're witty, they're wonderful. Sometimes stories about real people last for days. You're walking down the street three days after you heard a story. Oh, that is so funny. You still did, okay. Uh, I, so I, what I did, I took all those stories and, and I, uh, I assembled a book. About a, one out of 100 stories I got of those 9,000 people who joined is, uh, is an absolute classic and original humor. I've got a book out now called Dear Dr. Humor. Sold over 14,000 copies so far. I'm so proud of it. Let me share a couple stories from the, from the book you might appreciate. Dear Dr. Humor, when my daughter Kenesha was nine years old, she was given an assignment by her teacher to write a story on where my family came from. The purpose was supposed to be to understand your family history. I was not aware of her assignment when she asked me night at the dining room table, Grandma, where did I come from? I responded kind of nervously because my son and daughter and I were out of town and I was stalling for time until they returned. Well, honey, I'm not sure. I think the stork brought you. <laughs> okay, where did Mom come from then? Oh, um... I think the stork brought her too. Okay, Grandma, what about you? Where did you come from? I think the stork brought me too, honey. Okay, thanks, Grandma. I did nothing more about it until two days later when I was cleaning Anne's room, I read the, I'm cleaning Tamika's room, read the first sentence of her paper. For three generations, there have been no natural births in our family. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a high school principal from uh, Ohio. Dear Dr. Humor, principal of a public high school in a small town in Ohio. Last year at the end of the school year, a student the name of Jimmy Sexauer, spelled S-E-C-H-A-U-E-R, told me he'd not be attending my school next year. He was moving to a neighboring district. Two weeks into fall term, I realized the neighboring school had not requested Jimmy's records, which is standard procedure for a transfer student. I called the neighboring high school and the secretary answered the phone. I said to her, do you have a sex hour over there? <laughs> She answered, hell no, we don't even get a coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> Here's one from Montreal. Dear Dr. Humor, I left Montreal on Route 20 heading toward Quebec City when I decided to stop at a comfort station. The first toilet stall was occupied, so I went to the second one. I was no sooner seated than heard a voice in the next stall. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> I answered a little embarrassed, not bad. <laughs> and the stranger then said, what are you up to? <laughs> Talk about stupid questions. So I said, well, just like you, I'm driving east. Then I heard the stranger all upset say, look, I'll call you back later. There's some jerk in the next stall answering all my questions. <laughs> make, some, make some closing comments, try to keep us close on schedule a little bit. Uh, uh, thank, once again, thank you for inviting me to come and spend my view about life, and hopefully it's hopeful in so many ways. <laughs> it's my business card, which has the prayer of the National Association for the Humor Impaired on it, and I offer it to you as a gift. I'll stop by and pick up one. Uh, it goes like this, God, grant me the laughter 
to help me see the past with perspective, to face the future with hope, and to celebrate today without taking myself too seriously. And lastly, thank you. I didn't know until three years ago that it's fate I'm before you today speaking on humor until I read Sister Mary Margaret's third grade from American Martyr School in California. I read, my parents collected my grade reports. I forgot all about that. My parents had passed away many years ago. But we were cleaning the attic. We bought a new, a new condominium on the Mississippi River. I'm in love. I can sit there and have a beer in one hand and a fishing pole in the other. I think it's wonderful. And, but in doing so, we cleaned out the attic. And I found this box of all these old things. My parents had collected all my grade reports. I didn't know it was fate until I read Sister Mary Margaret's comments. Stewart is rather uninhibited. <laughs> really. <laughs> He displays a high level of energy, is pleasant, smiles constantly, and laughs with zeal. Isn't that nice? Because of his constant smile, one might think he is dim-witted. <laughs> uh, nothing to be further from the truth. I would rather character characterize him as bright, but abnormally cheerful. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.